Please welcome Satya Nadella. We are delighted to have you here. Thank you very much for joining us. No, it's my privilege and pleasure. Thank you so much, Toby, for inviting me up here. It's fantastic to be here in Cleveland. Well, you know, you are in the process of forming the future. You have reformed uh, Microsoft and reimagined it. Let's go back to what uh, formed you. Um, tell us about your parents. You know, I... Um I'm a product of uh, two people uh, who uh, really, I think, in a very fundamental way, helped me become who I am. My mom was a professor of Sanskrit. Uh, my dad uh, is essentially he was a civil servant, but he's a Marxist economist. Um, and. Um, and so they would have this ideological war at home. Um, we see this occasionally. Right. And so my, uh, you know, uh, my dad, in fact, I remember putting up a, pic, you know, a poster of uh, Karl Marx, and my mom put up a poster of uh, Lakshmi, who is the goddess of wealth. And, um, <laughs> and I, of course, decided that you know, my favorite cricketing hero from Hyderabad was the one that I worshipped. Um, and so in some sense, very early on, I decided and I was thought to think for myself, stand for my own uh, values, and more importantly, given uh, the physical and intellectual room to grow. Uh, and that curiosity, if I think back at it, it comes from that, uh, which is to have strong opinions, but also to have the ability to listen to others' opinions. In school, you're interested in playing cricket. Yeah, it's the most fascinating game. It's a real tragedy that the Americans don't play it. I won't, <laughs> I won't ask you to try to describe the, the game to us, or tell us the rules. But in school, um, you went to Hyderabad Public School uh, from 1978 through 84, and you roomed there, lived there. Yeah. And that school has a engraved on the walls there is a saying uh, which I think is very appropriate for you, and I wonder if you remember it. You are an eagle. To soar to, is your destiny. There are other worlds to discover, other horizons to explore. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a, uh, it's a beautiful line, set of lines uh, by um, an Urdu poet, uh, Muhammad Iqbal. Um, and I think it, it just captures, it is fascinating that you bring back the memories of my school. I was in the White House yesterday, uh, and it turns out that three of us from the same high school were in the White House yesterday. It's pretty strange. Uh, but uh, Ajay Banga, who was the CEO of MasterCard, and Shantanu Narayan, who was the CEO of Adobe, and me, all of us went to this middle of nowhere high school. And, um, and obviously, that school absolutely, I think one of the things that I think back again, similar to what I said about my parents, it really was not part at that time in the mid, late 70s, early 80s, uh, what I would call uh, the mainstream of, the United, I mean, of India. Um, but it had teachers and a student body that really allowed us to flourish um, and question, learn, and develop that deep sense of both curiosity uh, and interest in others, and which I think has just uh, definitely shaped me. I think back of my school days as perhaps one of the most formative days. I'm sure they were. It was my, before that, you know, one of the things, one of the earliest um, uh, memories I have uh, was my dad would uh, get, since he was in the civil service, uh, he would get posted to very different parts. And uh, there was this very remote uh, region of uh, India that he was in when I was born. I was a couple, maybe a couple of years old, uh, or three years old, perhaps. Um, and I remember a photograph uh, that I saw. I forget now, and it's definitely so long back. But it haunted me always, because that photograph was of um, uh, two uh, dead people. And uh, with all their life's belongings, uh, I remember distinctly a Philips radio, uh, 
um, and um, a charpoy, which is basically their bed. Um, and much later, I came to realize uh, that they were two uh, dead revolutionaries, um, and they were teachers. And it is always sort of, you know, I've always thought about, like, what led them uh, to leave their jobs as teachers to then go on to become revolutionaries. And that notion that I think we all talk about, which is there is um, talent everywhere, but not opportunity. Uh, and that, I, th I, I think, is sort of, in some sense, if I had to sort of say what would be my life's pursuit is to do my fair share, my own individual work, uh, to bring about uh, that opportunity. As a CEO of a multinational company, perhaps today, I understand that responsibility much more, uh, which is it's not about just, quote unquote, having a commercial enterprise everywhere. It's about the local opportunity you create everywhere. Mm. That's what really is the best thing one can do for even long-term business. So after a very uh, distinguished career in India in academics, you decided to come to the United States. Yeah, I don't know whether it's distinguished, but... Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's mixed reviews. I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> Thank you for that, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so why did you come to the United States? What was the reason? Um, you know, quite honestly, I mean, I, I remember applying for the visa, and I was thinking I'll get rejected, but uh, lo and behold, I got the visa. But the main curiosity I had... I'd never been to the west of Bombay, um, uh, and I never thought I would, actually. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, I showed up in Wisconsin. Um, Next and, step. And uh, it was just the just, most logical. Just a little beyond Bombay. That's right. Uh, it, I wanted to really um, get a master's degree uh, and in computer science. I had studied electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd fallen in love with computer science as I was studying electrical engineering. I knew, uh, I mean, I don't, I can't say that I had a very clear sense of software as that malleable resource uh, appealed to me. Uh, it felt like the thing that you learned in order to have impact everywhere. Uh, because I'd never seen anything like that. I mean, I'd, you know, my dad had bought me a Z80 uh, in the early 80s, um, and uh, I'd programmed in it, and it was fun. Uh, and then I rediscovered it back, perhaps, you know, while doing electrical engineering. Um, and I felt that this is the thing that's going to define the future, even though it, the contours of it were sort of all unclear. Um, and I wanted to pursue that. And... Um, and so, you know, that's what drove me to the U.S. And I got a great opportunity in, uh, you know, in, in University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. It was a small school. It was a very small student body. But I was able to create, even I remember the first semester, I was able to collect up uh, classes which uh, were pretty eclectic in terms of computer architecture on one end and the other side image processing. And it got me going on a journey that sort of even today lasts, uh, which is a love for how what computer science can do uh, to unleash or the imagination uh, that all of us have. Subsequently, yeah, you married and after Simon's son, and you wound up going to Microsoft and had a family. And one of your children's uh, first child was born with a disability. Yep. How did that affect you? Very, um, it was a big event. Both my uh, wife and I, uh, uh, we, we, uh, we've known each other ever since because both my uh, um, wife's father and my dad were colleagues in the civil service. Um, and, um, and we were both single children. And uh, so when uh, uh, Zane, our son, was born, um, quite honestly, it was, uh, he was born in with uh, a, a severe... Uh, damage to his brain because of in utero uh, asphyxiation. And for the first, uh, I would say maybe even a few years, I struggled with it, um, not even understanding what had happened, um, even thinking about it as something had happened to me. Uh, and in fact, it was Anu, my wife, who really got me to understand that it is about our son, not about me. Uh, and that is what, when it started clicking for me, 
uh, quite honestly, about being able to actually develop that deeper sense of empathy. Uh, because that was a set of words. I understood the intellectual meaning, but perhaps not uh, what it means uh, to be able to actually see the other person's condition uh, for what it is, uh, and then to help and to be able to empathize. And I must say, everything is not just my relationship with my son uh, that changed. It's my relationship with all of what I do uh, that changed at work and at home. Uh, and it definitely was the big turning point for us as a family. That's a very tough lesson to learn, a tough way to learn it. So uh, in 2014, um, you became the third CEO of Microsoft. And in your first speech to the country, uh, the company, you quoted Nietzsche uh, in the courage in the face of reality. What was the reality that you had to face with courage? It's fascinating. You know, in fact, I think. Um, I then later paraphrased it as said, really, you have, I mean, the, the courage in the face of reality, I think, is more obvious, which is you can't deny uh, the state you're in. You have to confront it, uh, see it for what it is. But really, the interesting thing is, the tougher one is what I believe uh, we leaned into, which is the courage in the face of opportunity. Um, ah. It's more important for us as organizations, as leaders of organizations, to be able to lean into a future that is uncertain. It's not conventional wisdom. Uh, but yet, for you to be able to take that first step, uh, because you can't, as a leader, stand back and then expect everybody else to move forward. Uh, you've got to call it as it is, but then show real courage to lead, to go where you think uh, is where the opportunity is, long before it's conventional wisdom. Interestingly, one of the first books that you gave out uh, to your group was about nonviolent communication. Why? <laughs> you know, um, Microsoft, one of the... Um, training classes we had uh, when um, I joined the company uh, was a class called Precision Questioning. And the idea was that uh, you're going to take anybody who has an idea or anybody who's presenting and then in the first five minutes demolish them. Uh, oh, nice. Uh, <laughs> by asking them Sounds all Sounds like of surgical training. There you go. <laughs> Uh, it definitely was surgery of a different kind. <laughs> and, and, and it led to what I think was, the, you know, it, was, it came out of uh, the right place, which is, hey, be intellectually honest, make sure you question. Uh, but it became a culture a bit more which was critical uh, and negative. Um, and one of the things is we're all symbolic beings. We are, you know, language matters. Uh, there is a way to get the amygdala uh, up and hijacked or a way for a person to feel like that let's actually uh, be responsive. Um, and so this book was the book that actually, by the way, my wife introduced me to it. And so I, I read it, and, um, and it is fantastic. It's, it gives you, I think, the most practical tools of how to, in fact, uh, practice empathy. And it starts with language. Um, and I felt that that was what we needed to do as a senior leadership team. It is not about being able to you know, do precision questioning of each other. It is about being able to develop a deeper sense of empathy for each other, what we are trying to accomplish individually and as a company, have a way for us to communicate, have a way for us to form a common bond as a set of leaders. Um, and uh, it was an unconventional thing. Um, and that's perhaps one of the things. I mean, I grew up in Microsoft. I'm not an outsider. You know, I'm a consummate insider. And, um, and in retrospect, that gave me more credibility to do unconventional things, I think, uh, than maybe even an outsider could have done. So what was your plan for Microsoft as you uh, took over the reins of leadership? 
Where did you what did you think you had to you wanted to change about it? What was important? You know, I had a clear sense of of where the tech is going, what we needed to do uh, as a company to pursue the tech trends. But the things that I also realized, in uh, retrospect, I would say I appreciated much more, but somehow intuitively I got there, was that we needed to renew our sense of purpose and identity, first and foremost. Uh, when I joined Microsoft in 1992, uh, we used to talk about a PC in every home and mm -hmm. every desk as the rallying cry. In fact, we used to even call it our mission. But in retrospect, I mean, by the end of the 90s itself, at least in the developed world, we had more or less achieved that. Yes. And uh, then what do you do? Um, you know, here you are, what you got up every morning for and, you know, you strive to do, uh, it's done. And I think we went into a bit of a, an identity crisis. So what comes next? And so to me, that bothered me. So one of the things I always felt that we need was to go back, in fact, to the very genesis of the company. Uh, if you think about it, the first product that Microsoft built, Bill and Paul uh, built, was the basic interpreter for the Altair. Now, obviously, a lot has happened since the Altair. But what is true of us today, as it was then, is that we are a company that produces technology so that others can produce more technology. That's who we are at our core. We empower people and organizations all over the planet to achieve more. So I, I wanted us to get back to that sense of purpose and mission and have it guide everything we did, both in terms of products we built, technologies we pursued, how we showed up with customers and partners. That, I think, was perhaps the most important thing. And then there was an aspect of culture, too. Those are the two bookends that I really, really felt that we needed to really renew our uh, focus on. Well, what about the culture? Now, that has been another amazing journey for me, and I perhaps... Uh, have grown to appreciate how important. I mean, as, I mean, it's, I think it's a, you know, it's a bit cliche to say this, but any technology can get commoditized. Any technology and product can be copied, but your culture cannot. Um, and so, again, thanks to my wife, I'd read a book uh, a few years before. Uh, I became CEO, uh, written by Carol Dweck, um, called The Mindset. And it, uh, it was another amazing book which had a significant influence on me because this fundamental concept that she captured for kids in school, right? If you take somebody who has got even more, a great innate capability and someone with less innate capability, but the person with great innate capability is a know-it-all, but the person with less is a learn-it-all, then you know how that story ends. The person who's a learn it all uh, will ultimately do better. And I think it applies to boys and girls in school. It applies to CEOs like me. Uh, and it applies to companies like Microsoft. And so we were able to grab hold of that meme, of the growth mindset, um, and really take that and make it the way we were going to have a dialogue around our culture. You know, we added to it uh, what are the practical ways. After all, we are in the business as a company of meeting the unmet, unarticulated needs of customers. It's very hard to come to, say, a, you know, Cleveland Clinic and say, Toby, tell me, uh, what's the next computer you want to wear, right? I mean, it's sort of, uh, you have to be able to understand what does one do in a surgery room or how does one teach anatomy. Uh, and infer that by developing a deeper sense of empathy. And that comes because of that core cultural attribute you have in your designers, in your engineers, in your salespeople. Uh, it's been transformative. I must say this is perhaps more than anything else uh, been the core to what at least people talk about change at Microsoft. And it's not something that we will ever be done. Sometimes people at Microsoft will come and some say, hey, Satya, I found the 10 people 
who don't have a growth mindset at Microsoft. <laughs> and, and I say, look, that's not the point. The point is for me to admit every day of my fixed mindset and being comfortable in it, because that's the only way to exhibit your growth mindset, is to know uh, never to become a know-it-all. So you, uh, on that same note, you reached out to other companies at that point, Google, Apple, uh, et cetera, and, uh, which was really foreign to what had gone on previously in Microsoft. You know, I mean, quite honestly, um, you know, as I said, I'm a, I'm a product of Microsoft. I'm a product of the company that uh, Bill and Paul founded and Bill and Steve built. And, um, and I'm proud of it, uh, every aspect of it. Um, and one of the things that they taught us, and for those of us who grew up there, understood was that as a platform company, uh, you absolutely need uh, to make sure partners succeed and you live in an ecosystem. I mean, take uh, any customer of ours. Uh, it's not a homogenous environment. Uh, you need to interoperate. Uh, you need to coexist. You need to solve their problems, not be dogmatic about any point of view you have. And so that's something that has always been uh, core to how I've approached. I never think of markets as zero sum. Uh, I think of it as... Uh, how can we construct uh, partnerships that ultimately, in a world where everything is going digital, there is no reason uh, to think of it all purely as a zero-sum game. So, you know, whether it's Apple, I think it's, uh, we, we have a fantastic service with Office 365. It is the most mm -hmm. obvious thing to make sure uh, that it is available on all devices. Um, and so partnerships, I think, are very much something that I grew up with. Uh, and, uh, and at the same time, also know, having the maturity to partner and compete. Um, and that, I think, is uh, how at least I think of uh, our business. You did another interesting thing. You brought Bill Gates back in. Uh, and he had been remote from the organization for a period of time. Tell me your thought process and what he con has contributed, which must be enormous. Yeah, I mean, Bill, uh, quite honestly, was you know, he's a constant presence, but he had, you know, uh, it was not a, uh, you know, once he left as CEO, he was, um, uh, in fact, full-time as a chief architect for Steve, and then he became part-time. Uh, and I have engaged, in fact, even throughout Steve's time at Microsoft, Bill was engaged in a few of the areas that I was, in fact, running. And so I've had uh, uh, the good fortune of uh, learning from Steve and Bill throughout. I mean, Bill's the founder of the company. And you know, when you have someone uh, who is the founder of the company who cares so deeply about the company and has high standards, let me say that, um, uh, it's just the best way to sort of, quite frankly, stay intellectually honest. Uh, there is many, you know, with Bill, there's no such thing as uh, I've achieved excellence or you've, you know, it's always about, oh, then <clears throat> raise the bar, raise the bar, raise the bar. Uh, and for him, for, the intellectual honesty he shows uh, in being able to both recognize where we are and what the opportunity can be, uh, I think is a real inspiration for all of us who grew up and even today, uh, anytime we talk about something like AI or what have you, which he cares deeply about, uh, he's quick to point out about how we're not even in the starting line. You know, you did a, recently a big acquisition about a year ago on LinkedIn. $26 billion. That's walking around money. <laughs> so th th tell us the, the thought process about what you thought that the two companies came together with and how they helped each other. Yeah, one of the things uh, for me, whenever I think about um, companies coming together, it really starts with even that shared sense of vision and purpose. Uh, having spent a bunch of time with both um, Jeff Wiener as well as Reid Hoffman, who's the founder of LinkedIn, uh, who's on our board now, is, they, you know, they have such a clear sense that one of the most pressing challenges of our times is to help every individual realize their economic opportunity. In fact, 
uh, the they conceive of LinkedIn as the economic graph. It's the full digitization of all the jobs in the world, the skills required, and the people profiled so that one can connect the dots between them and really help them achieve their economic potential by continuously upping their skills as the jobs evolve. Now, the, and it, it is that professional network and that economic graph brought together with what is in Microsoft's heritage of building the professional cloud now uh, made a lot of sense. Uh, you can imagine as a, a professional having your network with you in the context of every task. Uh, that's the most obvious one. Uh, being able to really bring these two assets, uh, but again, individually helping every professional uh, is what the vision is, and we're well on our way. I mean, whether it's the integration between Outlook and LinkedIn, or Skype and LinkedIn, uh, or our CRM product and LinkedIn. Uh, the idea that you can really bring the world's professionals together uh, not just with the productivity and communications, but even their professional network. You've had a couple of really interesting issues recently. Hey, um, maybe you want to tell people about that and what you did with it, because I thought you handled it beautifully. Yeah, no, Tay was, uh, so one of the things that happened um, uh, for, is we built a, a bot uh, first in China called Xiao Eyes. Uh, it's a conversational bot. Uh, it's uh, got, you know, I think north of some, um, you, know, you know, 60, 70 million uh, monthly active uh, users of it. And um, uh, it's on TV in China, in fact. Uh, you know, um, it's amazing to see the number, of, the session lengths, right? The, the amount of time people spend conversing with Xiao Eyes. So talking we, with a bot. You're talking with a bot uh, as sure. a friend. Um, and so we said, OK, let's bring that to the United States. And so we built uh, Tay uh, as a conversational bot. And the, the way this bot trains, though, is using other conversational streams out of social media. Uh, and in this case, uh, what happened was uh, we launched Tay. It behaved well. And then it stopped behaving well. And uh, what happened was that it was- Behaved badly. Let's yeah, it, was be it behaved badly because it learned, um, unfortunately, from the conversations that humans were tricking it to learn from. And uh, it is a, it is, the learning is that if you're building even artificial intelligence, uh, you've got to build it uh, so that it's resilient to such tampering. Um, and uh, I think what you were probably referring to is, I know it is, you know, it is, it's quite honestly, it is a shock to everybody uh, in our team. The, mm -hmm. the team that was developing it was passionate about it and uh, cared deeply. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's kind of like your child misbehaving in front of others. And, um, and so what I, I sort of encouraged, I mean, first is, well, we need to take responsibility, right? I mean, after all, uh, it's our product, it is mm -hmm. our creation, and we put it out there without sort of having uh, imagined the unintended consequences. So the first thing is we take responsibility. Uh, we apologize to anybody uh, that we uh, unknowingly um, you know, harmed. Uh, but more importantly, though, let us not shy away from learning and going after it again uh, with all of that learning. Uh, and knowing that, you know, the, for that team to know that uh, I'll fly air cover for them on that was important because it's easy. I mean, one of the things that, you know, when mistakes will happen in all uh, companies, uh, but there are mistakes that happen from which we have to learn and get better. And I think the job of the leader to give the ability uh, for the team to focus on the learning versus being risk averse, I think is super important. Yeah, I think that was great for your team. You had another event recently that we talked about when I was out at Microsoft recently, and that is WannaCry yeah. and uh, cybersecurity, which opens up a whole issue for us as we go into the 21st century with new technology. Yeah. WannaCry um, is aptly named. Um, <laughs> is, is, you know, the fundamental issue 
there are multiple ways to unpack this. One is, I think that it's clear as day for us that uh, digital technology, as it becomes more pervasive, we as the first responders have tremendous responsibility uh, to make sure uh, that we respond, we respond quickly, we respond uh, with an understanding of uh, both the complexities and the impact. Um, for example, one of the decisions I had to make as soon as um, uh, you know, uh, the worm uh, was going out of control uh, was to release uh, the patches for Windows XP um, you know, for even those who are not in uh, our support anymore. Um, and we made that decision. It was an obvious decision to make, um, and that helped uh, you know, make sure that they, it didn't spread further. But I also believe it's a shared responsibility, because we're talking about a 16-year-old operating system. Um, and at this point, it's out of support for a long, long time. And it's time for all of us, collectively, to do what I would consider to be the hard work of staying current and fresh, because there is no such thing. I mean, one of the things about cybersecurity is, as somebody said, uh, you can't get fit by watching others go to the gym. Um, you know, you have to actually practice <coughs> the operational security uh, posture that you need to have, and the operational security posture only starts by being current and being patched. Uh, Windows 10, for example, was not impacted by WannaCry. Um, and uh, that would have been a very good thing for everyone to have done. But at the same time, we realized that it's not easy. Uh, upgrades and patching requires you know, uh, real manpower and technology advances, which we are continuously making. But my call uh, was to all CEOs and others, executives, is to make sure you're funding even the basics. Sometimes I think a lot of us get carried away with the new shiny object. Um, and we don't pay attention to the need mm. for us. And today's threat vectors, quite frankly, don't come from even the compute endpoints. They're going to come from the HVAC system. Uh, and the fact that uh, that's happening uh, means cybersecurity and making sure that the systems that you're deploying are current and patched is super important. By the way, you know, I think it's pretty obvious that one of the most vulnerable groups in the country right now are hospitals. That's right. I mean, the, what happened in the UK was a good it's reminder. What happened that. in the UK and what's happened in the United States yeah. as well, and we're well aware of that. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about inventing the future. Um, we're now in the, the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, Robert Gordon wrote The Rise and Fall of American Growth. Um, is American growth stopped? Do we have, uh, are we at a pinnacle from which we will not recover, not continue to climb? I mean, Robert's book is a fantastic book. Uh, I've read it. Um, I mean, it's one of the best uh, books, or, which captures, I think, uh, that golden age of uh, whatever, 1870 to 1940, um, and how. Um, essentially what is all of what we think of as modern life got invented. Um, and his criticism, um, although I think he gives the PC a lot of credit because he says the last time there was real productivity growth was during the 1995 to 2005 and the um, uh, automation at the workplace. Uh, I think he, he points out that uh, there's a lot of tech but slow growth. Um, and there's some truth to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is one of the things that I think a lot about. I, I, I sort of say, you know, consumer driven, I've always been suspicious a little bit about consumer uh, driven growth. Uh, it has to be much more broad spread. Um, that's why I think, for example, of our innovation and our innovation vector has to be more balanced. In other words, um, it has to drive creation. Uh, it has to have broad impact across all industries. Uh, it can't be purely about a few creators and lots of consumers. There needs to be more balance in it. Uh, you talked about Minecraft in the intro video. I love Minecraft because it's not just a game. It's an open world. It sort of gets kids in school introduced mm -hmm. to STEM, both boys and girls. 
Um, and I'm not saying that, uh, that that's the one only tool, but I want us to have, whether it's in digital technology or whether it's in healthcare, uh, whether it's in insurance, whether it's in manufacturing, we have to sort of use technology that drives fundamental surplus in our economy, that it goes beyond uh, just consumer spending. Uh, it's, that means better educational outcomes, better healthcare outcomes, productivity. and better productivity broadly. And I think technology that really fosters that, I think, is the most important thing. Let's talk about AI for a second. Um, you know, everybody is excited about it, and uh, there is also concern about it. Are we going to 1984? Uh, is singularity something that we should be concerned about? How do you envision um, AI moving forward? And certainly, you are deeply involved in developing this technology. Look, I mean, it's, a, it's just pretty stunning as to what uh, the rate of progress in AI has been. Um, you know, I think these forces of um, uh, data, uh, lots of compute power, and some of the algorithmic breakthroughs, uh, like these deep neural nets inspired by, mm -hmm. in fact, uh, our, how our brains work, have really helped us make some advances, whether it's in speech recognition um, or in computer vision uh, or even machine translation, which has been pretty magical. I mean, we put this stuff together in Skype Translate. By the way, you can talk in English into Skype and it comes out in Chinese. That's right. And the ability to, in, in fact- In your voice. And so, you know, we, that was the magic of bringing essentially three models, right? One is the speech recognition, the speech synthesis, and the machine translation, and putting it into this neural representation or a deep neural network, uh, and magic uh, happens. And, um, and now we're exploiting that in many, many ways. Uh, you can now do a PowerPoint presentation and have it simultaneously translated into any language and you can follow along on your uh, phones. Uh, you can have a Skype broadcast, it's transcript, and it's fa fa fascinating. But I still believe that that symbolic grounding, the next level that is required in order for reasoning uh, and planning is still unsolved. Uh, I'm a believer that AI, is about augmenting human capability. That's a design choice, quite frankly. That's what I subscribe to. Mm -hmm. um, and we should now really go figure out what that next phase of AI is. And for example, one of the things that I'm very, very excited about is Cortana and what we're doing with it. Um, you know, I send off an email and I'll say, Toby, I'm gonna follow up with you. And guess what, I forget. Uh, Cortana doesn't. Uh, Cortana wakes up and tells me, oh, you said this to Toby. Uh, you better follow up, and that's you know. I believe me, as a, you know, as a CEO of Microsoft, it saves me every day uh, a lot of embarrassment on a lot of things I say in email, um, and the ability to have it come back and tell me that this is what you need to do next. Um, but we are far from. As somebody, you know, there's this amazing researcher out of Montreal that we work with, uh, uh, Joshua Bengio. <laughs> Uh, who's written one of the great books on uh, DNNs and deep neural nets. Um, and I was telling him, you know, the day AI can read um, Othello and tell him uh, that Iago is possessed by the devil, that's when you would know uh, that you have an intelligent agent. Uh, that's, to me, the new Turing test. And we are far from it uh, because I think the ability to that intuitive way that humans judge situations uh, is a, you know, it's a ge that general purpose learner uh, to take experience in one field and apply it to another the field. Uh, we have the beginnings of it in what we call transfer learning, but we have a long way to go. But we are well, you know, we are very excited about, especially machine reading and comprehension. Uh, that I think is one of the big frontiers of AI. Are you concerned uh, that we're going to get to the point where uh, we are outsmarted, if you will, by artificial intelligence? Well, I mean, I am, I think being outsmarted by artificial intelligence on things that only make us smarter uh, is not a bad virtuous cycle. Um, and so the question is, you know, when you put on a hollow lens, obviously it's got computer vision that's better than us and it can see. Uh, things that we don't see. 
Uh, you're walking a factory floor, and it'll help you make avoid uh, the six degrees of freedom robots that may be roaming around, because you can't, as a human, calculate mm -hmm. uh, that. Um, and so there are many, many places where I think AI, uh, you know, talk about healthcare and health outcomes. Uh, mm -hmm. It can uh, be absolutely transformative. Uh, so I think what is at the core is for us to push new technologies and then see it enhance our quality of life, enhance our productivity, enhance the economic surplus in an equitable way. That's, I think, what are more of the human challenges uh, than being worried about it. Well, I want to take this opportunity to uh, show you uh, the technology HoloLens uh, that uh, has been produced. I had my first opportunity to see it when they put me in a room, and essentially I was on Mars right. uh, with the uh, rover, for, uh, which was an absolutely astounding event. And we've been using this now, and Mark Griswold is here with his team, is going to give us a demonstration of... Yeah, no, I'm excited about it. After we finish, uh, we're going to have time for questions. Great. Thanks, Toby. It's really a great honor to be here. Thanks again for coming to, to Cleveland, funny. Satya. Um, I'm Mark Griswold, a professor at Case Western. Um, and I'm going to uh, be here a little bit with uh, Anne and Andy to show you some of the things that we're doing um, as part of this two and a half year old uh, partnership between Cleveland Clinic, Case Western, and Microsoft. I think this is the most amazing piece of technology that I've worked on in decades. Um, and unfortunately, uh, I don't have 600 of these to show you today. <laughs> but it's really something that you, you need to see in person. But we're going to do the best that we can today. We have a special camera that's going to show you um, a little bit about what we're seeing. And then um, during parts of this demonstration, we're going to show you the view from um, my headset. We really think this is going to impact uh, everything that we do from surgery to medical education. Um, to even fine arts. So we're going to show you just some of the things that we're going to do. So I'm going to jump in real quick. Um, and so if you look here, if you're just looking on the stage, you will see nothing. Um, but if you look through our HoloLens, you can see that we have a model of our health education campus that we're building just a few blocks from here. And this comes from the architect's computer. It looks somewhat like a, a, a normal architectural model, but this one's made of light. So we can do things like stick our head inside. So if Anne and Andy, you guys come inside. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. You can see the atrium. So you can see the trees that are going to be in there. You can see the stairways. And uh, Toby told me a few months ago that the whole Parthenon is going to fit inside that. <laughs> but it's a little bit hard to see that that window in the top, this glorious window that's going to be a part of that building, is about the size of a football field. Uh, but in HoloLens, we can actually jump inside and see it full scale. So now we can blow this up, and I can look up at that window. I can see the trees that are there. Do you guys see the stairways that are over there? Yeah. yeah. And so as uh, Toby said in, in our introduction, we're going to be using this to teach anatomy in this building. And that's going to happen on the second floor right over there. And so let's take a look at some examples of some anatomy here. So now we have a person standing in the room with us, a skeleton. You can see the bones. And we can, just with a click of my fingers, bring in some other systems. So cardiovascular system and the muscular system. And it would take weeks in the cadaver lab to get to this level. But just like that architectural model, you can stick your head inside. So you guys want to come inside and try to find the heart? Yeah. Oh, you can go through it. So do you guys see anything in particular? So I see the aorta there, and I can cut into the heart, and I can see the valves. Oh, yeah. Huh. That's the mitral valve, by the way. That's right. <laughs> All right, so with another click, we can bring in some other systems. So now we have the nervous system, and the cardiovascular system, and the digestive system. And these kinds of views would take hours in the cadaver lab. And in particular, I would lose the context 
as to where everything is. But here I can see it all together in 3D. And so you can imagine that this is like having x-ray vision. You can see the 3D structures here with just a few clicks. Do you guys see anything interesting? Could you guys point out the mitral valve again? Can you guys use your hands? <laughs> but we, yeah. again, if you look at the three of us up here, we must look crazy, right? <laughs> but we can all use our fingers to say, yep, yeah, there's the mitral valve. So let's take one more look. And this is the, now a little closer view of the heart. We can make it bigger. We can see some of the vessels. Can you guys point out the mitral valve now? <laughs> All right, can you guys make a diagnosis? Does this seem like a healthy heart to you guys? You see that, Ann? Looks pretty good to me. All right, let's, let's reveal some details here. There's a, there's a blockage. Oh, yeah. So if we come up here and look at the left coronary artery, I can use my purple yeah. pointer here to point out. Now we have a blockage there. That's no good. And so we can see all of this in context. And just like before in the whole body, I can come in and I can slowly cut into the heart. I can see the valves. And I can see detail that I just, it's really difficult to see these kind of things in a cadaver. And so here in just these few short minutes, we've gone through the skeletal system, muscular system, digestive system, nervous system. We've done a close-up of the heart. So we really think this is going to change the way that we, we teach. Mark, so, have you got the, nerve, you got the uh, brain there for us? I could bring up some brain if you bring would like, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a closer look. I'm going to skip over the digestive system here. Okay. So now we can look at real data from a patient's MRI scan. So these are white matter fiber tracts. They're kind of like the information superhighways of the brain. They're communicating information from one side to the other. And here, each color represents a different function. And so we can take this on an individual patient, understand their anatomy, and for example, if they happen to have something like a brain tumor, which we've represented over here. Do you guys see which tract is affected there? Can you guys, let's just even go by color, which tract <laughs> is affected? Do you guys see, it's the light blue one? Yeah. It's hitting the light blue one, but these, these dark blue and dark green ones are not impacted, and those are the ones that have to do with motion. So this patient would be able to move still, but they might have trouble with see? touch or with vision, that's right. And I've been looking at these kind of data for about 15 years, and I thought I understood the 3D structure of the brain. I didn't understand it fully until I saw it in HoloLens. I just had this aha moment where I understood things for the first time. So with that, we'll move on. I just want to say thank you again for the wonderful partnership. It's been really great. So uh, there are microphones over here and over here for questions, and uh, I think I see a f first one. No? Okay. So um, I, you can imagine uh, what this means uh, in terms of us understanding both anatomy and you can imagine teaching all kinds of uh, additional things, and we're starting to see the first sort of clinical applications of this now as we try to... Uh, reframe uh, structures uh, and understanding of uh, both anatomy and surgery and explaining things to patients. Yeah. And uh, you and I were having an interesting conversation about the potential for this uh, as we, and I challenged him. One of the things that uh, drives both patients and doctors crazy is the fact that there's a computer between the doctor and the patient and then the doctor's doing this and, the, and nobody likes it. So my challenge is to him uh, is to take natural voice recognition uh, in the HoloLens and begin to get rid of the computer that's in between us. Do you accept yeah, no, the challenge? Absolutely. I mean, it's a speech-first device, actually. I mean, if you saw the doctor, he was, you know, both, mostly gestures and speech. 
Uh, and it's, so it's absolutely doable, and um, that'll be the next frontier. But I mean, overall, I mean, what HoloLens has done, uh, you saw a fantastic example of it in terms of what it can do to education. I was, as, as a person who, you know, trained as an electrical engineer but never understood Maxwell's equations, I was thinking, God, if only I had HoloLens, I would have had better grades. Um, uh, that's my excuse. You turned out okay. <laughs> But what, beyond education or healthcare, uh, it's tremendous to see. One of the things that I was excited about, because the, in Cleveland today, I had a chance to even uh, visit with the Tri-City, you know. Uh, Tri-C. Uh, Tri-C, and they were just doing some fantastic work of training kids uh, for jobs of the future, uh, whether it's in manufacturing or in other sectors that are all going to require uh, new skills. Uh, there was this virtual welding thing that I used. Uh, and I said, wow, that's a way to learn and teach a welder. Uh, the way for people to conceive of all the new ways of manufacturing, industrial design is going to be completely transformed. So I think that the frontline work uh, is also going to be transformed because of technology uh, that is, in fact, going to be high tech, like things like HoloLens. Great.